Today we're going to look at a result that may seem overly technical, but it'll actually allow us to produce some nice summation identities which would otherwise be very difficult to get at. So let's see this result and then we'll do some examples. So we'll suppose that f and g are functions satisfying this like kind of complicated relationship. We have f of x minus f of y is equal to f of g of x, y. Then we'll also suppose that we've got a sequence denoted by a sub n. Then the result is that the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of f of g of a n a n minus 1 is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of f of a n minus f of a 0. Okay, so let's sketch out a proof of this and then, well, like I said, we'll do some examples. So we'll start over here with this left-hand side. So I'll just copy it over. So we've got that sum as n goes from 1 to infinity, f evaluated at g evaluated at a n a n minus 1. Now I'm going to do two things at once. I'm going to apply this functional identity that we have right here. And I'm also going to rewrite this as a limit of partial sums. So that will give us this limit as capital N goes to infinity of the sum as N goes from 1 to capital N of F of, let's see, it'll be A sub N minus F of A sub N minus 1. And now you can probably see what's going on here. We in fact are going to end up with a telescoping series. So here we've got the limit as capital N goes to infinity. So I'm going to pull out the nth term from the first f of a n. That's going to give me f of a sub capital N. And then we'll have plus the sum as n goes from 1 to capital N minus 1 of f a n. And then, well, I guess I should say while I'm doing this, I'm going to split this sum into two pieces. Then I'll have the sum as n goes from 1 to capital N minus 1 of another f a n. You might say, well, that looks like a n minus 1. But in fact, for this portion, what I'll do is I'll take all of the n's and replace them with n plus 1's that's going to re-index this. But observe that that should push our starting point down to n equals 0. I already pushed my ending point to n minus 1. But what I'm going to do is take that first term out, and that'll give me f a 0, or maybe the 0th term, if you will. OK, so next up, let's observe that this sum here will cancel with this sum here. And, well, we're left with exactly what we need. After that cancellation, we have the limit as n goes to infinity of f of a n minus f of a 0. Okay, so now that we've kind of seen how this works, let's look at some examples. For our first example, we'll look at the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of the arctan of 1 over 2n squared. And, well, let's recall that there's this nice subtraction formula for the inverse tangent. And you can derive this via the subtraction or addition formula for the tangent function. So we've got arctan x minus arctan y is equal to arctan x minus y over 1 plus x y. So the goal here is to take the argument of arctan inside of our sum and rewrite it in a way so that we could pull it apart into two different sequence type terms. So notice uh, the role of x should be played by a sub n, whereas the role of y by a sub n minus 1. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, it's going to go something like this. So we're going to take that argument of arctan and rewrite it as n squared minus the quantity n squared minus 1 in the numerator. So that clearly gives us a 1 in the numerator. And then in the denominator, we're going to write that as n squared plus n minus, or sorry, that should be plus n squared minus n. So that clearly adds up to 2n squared in the denominator. And now we're going to rewrite this as, well, we've got our sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of the arctan of 
So I've got n over n plus 1 minus n minus 1 over n all over 1 plus n over n plus 1 times n minus 1 over n. So you can check just the symbolic arithmetic that all of that works. So in the end, what we see is that we can apply our rule over there where a sub n is simply n over n plus 1. So notice this is our a sub n term, this is our a sub n minus 1 term, and then so on and so forth. So applying this rule, we should have the limit as n goes to infinity of arctan of capital N over N minus 1 minus the arctan of, well, what's the zeroth term here? Oh, sorry, that should be N over N plus 1. Well, the zeroth term would be the arctan of 0. The arctan of 0 is 0, so we're okay there. But notice here, this limit as N goes to infinity of this n over n plus 1 will tend towards 1. The inverse tangent of 1 is pi over 4. So here we get the answer is pi over 4. Okay, let's look at another example with this inverse tangent function. So for our next example, we're going to look at this nice uh, sum involving the inverse tangent function and odd indexed Fibonacci numbers. So we have the arctan of 1 over f sub 2n plus 1, where f sub n is the nth Fibonacci number. So in order to look at this, we're going to use something called Cassini's identity. And what it says is the following. We have f sub 2n plus 1 squared is equal to 1 plus f sub 2n times f sub 2n plus 2. But now we can rearrange this a little bit and we'll get 1 over f sub 2n plus 1 is equal to, well, let's see, that's taking the reciprocal of the whole thing and then multiplying one of the denominators over, we should have an f sub 2n plus 1 in the numerator and a 1 plus f sub 2n times f sub 2n plus 2 in the denominator. And lastly, what we'll do is take the recursion identity for the Fibonacci number, which observe that would say something like this. f sub 2n plus 2 is equal to f sub 2n plus 1 plus f sub 2n, and move the f sub 2n over, thus solving for the f 2n plus 1. So that will leave us with an f 2n plus 2 minus an f 2n over a 1 plus f 2n f 2n plus 2. Okay, nice. But now, notice that this thing right here, this reciprocal of this odd Fibonacci number, is now written in a format that looks like that right-hand side of our difference formula for the inverse tangent. So that means we should be able to write this as, well, the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of the arctan of this f 2n plus 2 minus f 2n over 1 plus that product. Okay, nice. So now let's note that our sequence in this case is um, this 2n plus second Fibonacci number. So that's playing the role of a sub n. So this a sub n over here. So that would be like this term right here. This would be like a sub n minus 1. Okay, so keeping that in mind, by our result, this is going to collapse to the limit as n goes to infinity of the arctan of, let's see, we have f uh, sub 2n plus 2 uh, minus the arctan of f of 2. Because of how the index is, well, built, the zeroth term is the second Fibonacci number. But... Observe that as n goes to infinity, the argument of this arctangent goes to infinity, but we know that that means that the entire thing goes to pi over 2. That's a well-known limit involving the inverse tangent. And then we also know that f sub 2, the second Fibonacci number, is 1. 
the inverse tangent of one, like we saw in our last example, is pi over four. So in the end, we get pi over four, which I guess that's the same value that we had before. Okay, so let's finish this off with one more example. Our last example will involve the inverse sine function. And we're gonna, gonna find the sum as n goes from one to infinity of the arc sine of, well, this kind of crazy rational object here. And, well, we're gonna use this difference formula for the inverse sine. So we've got arc sine x minus arc sine y is equal to arc sine of x times the square root of one minus y squared minus y times the square root of one minus x squared. But in fact, this only holds if x squared plus y squared is less than one. And now I'm gonna start by taking this argument of the inverse sine function and giving it a name. And I'm gonna maybe name this b sub n. And what we'll wanna do is decompose this b sub n into something like this, where that's built out of a sequence a sub n well, and maybe it's a sub n minus one type term. And well, maybe I won't go through all of the construction details, but I'll just say which sequence works. So if you set a sub n equal to two n over n squared plus one, then what you get is the following. So you're gonna get b sub n is equal to, let's, it'll be a n minus 1 times the square root of 1 minus a n squared and then minus a n times the square root of 1 minus a n minus 1 squared. Okay, so we've got something like that. And furthermore, notice that our inverse sine function uh, identity only involves if x squared only works if x squared minus y squared is less than or equal to 1. But maybe we'll also need to note something about the size of, well, whoever's playing the role of that x squared and y squared. And that's gonna be this a n minus one and a n. So observe that this a n squared plus a n minus one squared is less than or equal to one for all n not equal to two. So, Okay, well, that's interesting. That means we probably have to split this into two pieces. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do right here. So using our formula up here, as well as splitting things off, we get the following. So we'll have arc sine of B1 plus arc sine of B2 plus, and then we're gonna have the sum as N goes from three to infinity, of the arc sine of B3. But I'm gonna take that arc sine of B3 and split it up using, well, our notation down here as well as this. So that'll be the arc sine of a n minus one minus the arc sine of a n. Okay, great. But notice that that last sequence is definitely going to be some sort of telescoping sequence, just like we saw before. And well, in this case, it's just gonna leave us with the uh, setup when we have n is equal to three, the first term. And well, why is that? Well, that's because as n goes to infinity, this a sub n goes to zero, but then the inverse sine of zero is zero, so that part disappears. Okay, so now let's start putting some numbers into this. So here we're gonna get the arc sine of B1, but you can check by plugging one into this that that's just gonna give us the arc sine of one. And then we have the arc sine of B2, but you can check by plugging one into this, what you'll get is the arc sine of, let's see what it is. It's gonna be three over five. And then lastly, we'll have the one leftover term from this telescoping series, and that'll be the arc sine of four over five. And that's because a sub two is four over five. At that point, you're working with the a term instead of the b term because of how we split that up. But now I wanna notice that we can easily calculate the arc sine of three over pl five plus four over five. And that's by looking at this nice three, four, five right triangle. 
and observe that with this three, four, five right triangle, this angle right here is the arc sine of three over five. And we know that because if you take the sine of this angle, well, that's gonna be opposite over hypotenuse three over five. But then this angle up here is going to be the arc sine of four over five. And we can see that because the sine of this orange angle is, well, opposite over hypotenuse, four over five. But then we know that we started with a right triangle, which means that, well, the sum of these two angles plus the right angle has to be 180. That's the standard rule for taking sums of angles of a triangle. 180 is pi in radians. Well, this right angle is pi over two in radians. That means that the sum of these other angles also has to be pi over two. So we get the arc sine of one, which is pi over two, plus another pi over two. So in the end, we get pi. So I think that's a nice way to calculate this otherwise very intimidating sum.